Second Timothy uh, chapter two verse ten is where we're going to be focusing. Let me read for us uh, verses eight through thirteen. Second Timothy two verse eight. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Let's pray. Father, we've already acknowledged in song that you are good. Good. We thank you so very much for that. Lord, we thank you for expressing that goodness in the word of God. In your son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth to become one of us. Not merely as an example, but to offer salvation, to offer reconciliation, to offer peace with God. Lord, this morning we want to acknowledge the primacy of your word. We want to acknowledge the work of your spirit in and through us. We pray that you would teach us this morning from your word. May we subject ourselves to it. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're gonna look at two things, a method and a message. So the the sermon is really split into two parts. The second part is what you would normally think of as a sermon. The first part, might be what you would think of as like a lesson of some sort, Um, a method and a message. But before we dive in and look at verse 10 in particular, of course, it would be helpful if we knew a little bit about the book of Timothy as a whole, about the context. Uh, There was a story not that long ago that came up in uh, Reader's Digest. Uh, The person writing says, every year there's a softball game between our marketing department and the support staff, and every year the support staff wins or so they think before the Spinmeisters took over. The marketing department is pleased to announce, read a memo issued to all employees after the game, that for the 2005 softball season, we came in second place, having lost only one game all year. (laughs) The, The support department, however, had a rather dismal season as they won only one game. Of course, illustrating the, the necessity of context in order to actually understand what's going on. If we only focus on the uh, minute details, uh, we will be subject to whatever someone wants to tell us. If we look at the broader context, we'll have a much better idea of what's going on. So as we look at the broader context of 2 Timothy, I'd like to do that by way of explaining a method of studying the Bible. So Duane, go ahead and go to the next slide there. Uh, What we're going to look at is something that is not rocket science, it's not super special, it's not even unique to studying the Bible. It is very, very, very simple. Go on to the next slide. It boils down to this, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Ask questions of the text. Go ahead, Duane. Ask questions of the text. Six questions, who, what, when, where, why, how. None of those are unique to studying the Bible in in particular, and none of those are something that you haven't heard before. In fact, I'm hoping that all of you learned this in elementary school or middle school or somewhere along the line. Who, what, when, where, why, how. This is sort of the, the minimum amount of information that you need to know about anything. Let's say a police report, for instance. You need to know the who, what, when, where, why, and how. There may be other things, there may be a lot more detail, but this is like the minimum amount of information that you need to know. So that's it. That's the method. That's what it boils down to. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Now, my recommendation, Duane, if you'd uh, move us along there, is to start at the top. What I mean by that is start at the outermost circle. Go ahead. 
which means that if we are uh, looking at 2 Timothy 2.10, which we're going to be doing this morning, then we want to start with 2 Timothy 2. Go ahead there, Dwayne. That's the outermost circle in this case. That's the largest context that we're looking at. Of course, you could expand this all the way out to the Bible, but in the interest of uh, time, 2 Timothy 2. Then after that, you want to ask those same questions about 2 Timothy chapter 2. That happens to be the chapter that the verse uh, shows up in. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You want to ask who, what, when, where, why, how. Then after that, you want to ask those same questions about the paragraph that 2 Timothy 2.10 shows up in, which is, you probably can't see that, can you? 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 13. That's what we just read this morning. Who, what, when, where, why, how. And then finally, you can ask those questions about the verse itself, 2 Timothy 2.10. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So it's a fairly simple method, but you can use it at multiple levels, and you'll find that you're learning different information at each level as you descend down and down to the verse that you were looking at. Okay, so I, I, I've given you, I guess, only half of the method, right? The, the, this half is, what should you be asking of the text? But the second half is, how in the world are you going to answer the questions, right? If you're supposed to ask who, what, when, where, why, how, how are you go going to get the answers? <clears throat> well, I have great news for you, Duane, go ahead. It's even easier, right? There's six questions that you need to ask, but there's, there's only two things you need to do to answer it. Read the text and observe the text. Go ahead, Duane. Read the text, observe the text, and repeat. It's really that simple. Now, you may think I'm being too simplistic, but I'm really not. This is what it boils down to. You read the text and you observe the text. If you don't get it, then you repeat. You read the text and you observe the text. You ask the question, who? And let's say in a book like 2 Timothy, you might be writing, who wrote the book? Okay, so start reading and see if the author identifies himself. Well, it turns out he does, right? Verse one, the very first word, Paul. Okay, great. There we go. We got it. That was easy, right? You read the text, you observe the text, and you repeat. Now, I put a little caveat up there. I tried to make it smaller so that hopefully you can't see it as well. Uh, if you get stuck, <laughs> you can consult another version. You can consult uh, commentaries. You can consult a uh, Bible dictionary, those sorts of things. Uh, go ahead, Dwayne, bring those up. Uh, consulting another version is actually a great first step because if you're used to reading, say, the English Standard Version, uh, you're going to get used to the words and to the phrases that the ESV uses. And so if you switch to, say, New American Standard Version, the language that's used is very different. It's trying to communicate the same meaning, but the language is very different. And what that does is it forces your brain to kick into gear and to think about it a little bit more. And you'll find yourself wondering, oh, I never considered it that way before. So that's actually my first recommendation. If you're, if you're getting stuck on a particular question or an issue, try reading it in another version. That will help a lot. Now, of course, there's lots of other resources. If you jump straight to your study Bible notes or if you jump straight to the commentary, the problem is you're, you're really short-circuiting the learning process. Uh, you can do that, and if you just wanted to get an A on a test, that might be a good thing to do. Uh, but I assume most of you are reading the Bible to learn, right? And the best way to learn is to formulate your own opinion, your own idea from the text first, and then when you go look at the commentary, you can compare and contrast, and you can see what they said, and you can actually evaluate it from more of a critical standpoint rather than just accepting whatever you read from the commentators. So... By the way, this, this method that I'm describing here, who, what, when, where, why, how, and you answer the questions by reading and observing, this is what the commentators do anyway. This is the same thing that they do. <clears throat> so as long as you can read, you have uh, the primary skill that you need to understand the Bible. Read and observe the text. Okay, Duane, go ahead to the next slide there. Uh, so we're going to look at this method, and we're going to look at how uh, it's applied to our passage right here, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 10. And in the interest of time, we're not going to go into all of the details, but what I am showing you here is uh, I, I'm trying to bring you along in the process of asking these questions and answering them. So to say that differently, in a typical sermon or even in a typical Sunday school lesson, uh, the, the teacher will stand up there and they will present to you on 
say, a silver platter, the results of their research, the results of their reading and observing the text. Uh, what I want to do is kind of show you maybe an in-between step. I'm not giving you the finished product. I'm giving you here sort of the raw data points that would be used to generate the final product. And of course, the goal here is I want, I want you to see how this works. <clears throat> so we want to look at 2 Timothy 2.10. Let's start with 2 Timothy. And the first question that we'll ask, Dwayne, is who, right? Uh, it's an epistle, so one way that we could answer this is who's writing it and who is he writing to? Well, we can find that out very easily. Paul's writing it to Timothy as well as to the church that is at Ephesus, which is where Timothy is serving. Uh, several verses indicate those data points. Now, what is he writing? What is the book of Timothy about? At this point, uh, when you're looking at a book level, you could answer this with an outline. You could answer this with a paragraph summary. Uh, you could answer this by maybe trying to, to identify the primary themes of the book. Uh, or, like I've done, you could simply write down main points, maybe things that recur or that, that uh, the author is, is seeming to highlight. And th that's all that I've done here. Um, Paul wants to strengthen Timothy in the Lord, encourage him to not be ashamed. Uh, he wants him to stand strong against suffering. Uh, he does not want him to be distracted. This is a, a major concern. Uh, he wants Timothy to fight falsehood. He wants him to learn the word and to preach the word. And he wants to underscore the faithfulness of God. These are all things that come up over and over and over again in the book of 2 Timothy. And you can identify those same things and maybe a different set of things as well, simply by reading and observing the text. Okay, so who, what, next up is when. When was the book written? Well, about 65 AD. Uh, it's probably the last epistle that Paul wrote, and it's possibly a second imprisonment that he was in. Now, this is the question that everyone wants to run directly to the commentators and say, okay, just tell me, just give me the date. Uh, well, how did the commentators figure out when it was written in the first place? By reading and observing the text. That's, that's how they figured it out, right? There's not a magic formula. You can't carbon date a manuscript and find out the precise year that it was written, mostly because we don't have any of the autographs. We don't have any of the original manuscripts. Uh, so in, in other words, there's no magic formula for, for answering this question. You simply read the text and you observe it, and you, you read it in light of the broader context, in this case of the New Testament. If you want to know when 2 Timothy was written, we have some help from church history, right? It's called 2 Timothy, so we could probably surmise that it came after 1 Timothy, just based on church history, right? Because that's, that's where the title comes from. Uh, but we can also look at the book of Acts, and we can see what Paul did in the book of Acts. We can see where he went. We could see who he met, who he worked with. He talks about Ephesus in the book of Acts. So uh, this is written to Timothy at Ephesus. So there's some, possibly some information there to help us date it. Of course, we can compare with his other epistles and so on and so forth. So long story short, the commentators might have a little bit better idea of this than you or I, but that's only because they've read and observed more than perhaps we have. Uh, you can figure this out from the text, is, is my point here. When? Somewhere around 65 AD. Where? We also get this information directly from the text. Paul was in Rome. Timothy was in Ephesus. Next up is why. Uh, now, this, you can kind of see where you get to choose how you want to answer these questions. You could answer why from a theological perspective. You could answer it from a pragmatic perspective, which is what I've done here. Uh, Paul mentions that he longs to see Timothy, uh, but he also mentions that he's in prison, so he can't just go wherever he wants. He concludes in chapter 4 by asking Timothy to come and visit him. So from a pragmatic standpoint, Paul wrote, wrote 2 Timothy, of course, to encourage him, to teach him, to do all sorts of things, but also to ask him to come visit him because he missed him, because he wanted to see him. He wanted to be refreshed by his friend, Timothy. Lastly then, is how. And again, I took a bit of a pragmatic standpoint on this. How was this letter transmitted? It seems by a man named Tychicus, who also shows up in uh, chapter 4, presumably to replace Timothy so that Timothy could go visit Paul. 
Uh, if, if you're asking for more of a theological perspective, then we also get the answer to that as well, by the Holy Spirit. Paul says explicitly, explicitly by the Holy Spirit, chapter 1, verse 14. Okay, so that's sort of the big context. And like I said, uh, I'm not delivering this to you on a silver platter. I'm just giving you the data points to sort of see how that process works. So let's, let's go into the next circle, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and ask that same set of questions. Who? Now, as you might guess, it hasn't changed significantly. Paul is still writing to Timothy, but we actually get more information. We get more detail here. In verse 1, chapter 2, 1, he says, you then my child. So he refers to Timothy as his child. Uh, not biological, but here uh, his spiritual child, his disciple, if you will. Uh, we also get mention of disciples of Christ, disciples of Paul, disciples of Timothy. Uh, chapter 2, 2 has a long chain there. Uh, also the church that Timothy is serving, which is Ephesus, uh, them, they are mentioned several times. The elect, which would be the church at large, is mentioned in our verse, chapter 2, verse 10. False teachers are mentioned uh, towards the end of the chapter. And then uh, the devil, I didn't put it up there, but the devil is also mentioned in the last verse of the chapter. So there's actually a lot of different people that show up in uh, just this short little chapter. Okay, secondly, what? What does chapter two talk about? Well, it focuses on discipling others. That's a major theme. Um, enduring hardship for Christ is a major theme. Uh, Paul charges the church not to quarrel. He charges Timothy uh, especially to study the word of truth. He notes that God uses everyone for his own purposes. Uh, he encourages Timothy and his church to pursue holiness, righteousness, faith, love, peace, he encourages Timothy to be kind, to teach, and to correct. And you'll notice, perhaps, as we're going through this, that as you do this, as you break things up into who, what, when, where, why, how, you sort of have to separate things out. What you're going to see is that verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, shows up in almost every section. And that's okay, uh, because we need to break things down into smaller pieces to understand it better. Once again, when you are sharing this, say, with your small group or with your family or in Sunday school, you would then put it back together in a coherent whole so that someone could digest it a little, a little bit easier. Okay, so uh, we did the what. What about the when? Uh, mostly all the time, uh, most of the commands in here have a durative aspect and they're things that you could do at any time. Uh, but specifically, um, during suffering, we get some commands there. When quarreling starts, when temptations come, where does all of this happen? Uh, largely in the church, but also in the world. Paul is in prison, he mentions, and also heaven. He mentions heaven. Now, why? Why is chapter 2 here? Uh, well, actually, we get a why answer from chapter 2, verse 1, to strengthen Timothy. That's what the chapter starts out with. To encourage him to not be distracted. This is a major theme of this chapter, is don't be distracted by other things, whether it be the world, whether it be passions, um, and then also to ensure that the word is studied and taught by Timothy and by his church. Okay, who, what, when, where, why, and lastly, how, by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, uh, by not being distracted and by being holy to the Lord, uh, by considering what Paul has said, that comes up in 2.7, by remembering Jesus Christ, that comes up in 2.8, trusting in God's firm foundation, fleeing youthful passions with gentleness, and by doing your best. All of those things relate to how you're going to accomplish the what that is uh, talked about in chapter two. Okay, so we're nearing the end. Uh, we're gonna skip the, the paragraph rundown and just look real briefly at, at chapter 10, or I'm sorry, at verse 10 there. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, first off, Paul, the elect, those are the actors that show up. Uh, what, enduring everything. When, all of the time. Where, in prison, Paul's in prison. He also talks about heaven. Why? For the elect, for the sake of the elect, that they obtain salvation. And how? The word of God, the faithfulness of Christ. Okay, so that was the first part that, that sounds probably a little bit more like a lesson. Uh, but that's the method. And the whole reason why I give you this is not because it's the best thing since sliced bread, but because it's, it's a method, it's very simple. And if you're looking for a way to study the Bible, 
This is a very easy, simple way to do it and to get information out of the text. Ask those questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, and then you read the text and you observe the text for your answers. So now a message. We looked at a method and now a message. Let's remind ourselves verse 10 is what we're looking at. We have a little bit more of the context now. Verse 10 says, Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Okay, now anytime you see a therefore, what, what should you ask? What is it there for? Great, see, even that's easy to remember, right? Um, well, in this case, I, I think it's there for us to look back at verse 9. Uh, in this case, I think that's what Paul primarily has in mind. Verse 9 says, uh, The gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Yeah, perhaps we could even translate this as even so, or all the more so, something along those lines. He's already said he is in prison. He's enduring prison and suffering. And now he says, I endure everything now, what does that mean? I endure everything. This one's even simpler. It means I endure everything. It means I endure everything. There's probably two aspects to this. The one is that Paul is committed to enduring everything. This is a mental state. This is a, uh, a decision that Paul has made beforehand. I endure everything. I will endure everything. No matter what comes my way, I will endure it. But secondly, this is something that has been demonstrated by Paul's life again and again and again and again. We just read verse 9. He's suffering and he's in prison. It's no light thing for him to say, I endure everything. He's enduring something right now as he's writing. Not only that, if you look at the, the, the broader New Testament context, what do we see? We see Paul again and again going through various sufferings, various trials. If you read 2 Corinthians 11, you'll get a long list of all sorts of things that Paul endured for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the elect. What I want to do just real briefly is flip over to Acts chapter 14. Keep your finger in 2 Timothy, but flip over to Acts chapter 14. I just want to show you one example of what Paul means when he says, I endure everything. Acts chapter 14, we're in the middle of uh, one of Paul's missionary journeys. <clears throat> and we're going to start reading in verse 19. Acts 14, 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When he had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Okay, so because I know our uh, New Testament geography is not as good as maybe we'd like, uh, Lystra and Derby are 30 miles apart. Lystra and Derby are 30 miles apart. You can easily drive there in a car, right? But Paul didn't have a car. Um, verse 19, Jews, Paul is in Lystra, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. So these, these guys are chasing him uh, to Lystra, and they persuade the crowds that this guy's not really all he's cracked up to be, and they stone him to the point that they think he's dead, and they drag him out of the city and leave him there. They don't continue to stone him because they've already continued to the point that they think he's dead, right? If they didn't think he was dead, they would have kept on stoning him. And then what, what happens? Verse 20, But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. On the next day, he walks 30 miles to Derby after having 
been stoned and left for dead on the side of the road. On the next day, he gets up and walks 30 miles. And why does he do this? Well, we have it right here in Acts. But it's for the sake of the elect, right? Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So when Paul says, I endure everything, it's no light thing for him to say that. He's been through a lot. And he knows very well what it means to say that. And yet, he is still committed. He is still committed to this. Towards the end of his life, people think this was, this was the last letter that he wrote. And this is basically him at the end. And he's still saying, I'm committed, no matter what, to endure everything for the sake of Christ. In this case, verse 10, he says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Now, here comes our method again, right? Who, what, when, where, why, how. Uh, Elect, let's ask the question, what does elect mean? It's not a word that we normally use in our everyday conversation. But in short, it means chosen. Uh, It shows up a little over 20 times in the New Testament. And if you look up those references, you'll see that many of the times it is actually chosen, it is translated as chosen, uh, sometimes as elect. Uh, But it's the idea of selecting something from a larger group of people or things. We do still use the word, actually, uh, maybe not in our normal speech, but in some contexts, and one that's very recent, actually, Donald Trump is now the president-elect, right? What does that mean? That means that he is the one that's been chosen. The representatives have chosen him, and he is now the president-elect. He's not yet president, but he's been chosen to be the next one. So the the word still persists in some contexts. In this case, there is definitely an Old Testament precedent for this word elect. Uh, We can read in Deuteronomy 7, 6. I'll read that for us. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So that word chosen showed up. That's the, that's the same word that we're looking at, chosen, the same concept that God has selected out of all of the peoples of the earth. He selected Israel to be his people. And it, it's, almost, it's almost mentioned twice in Deuteronomy 7 because first he says, uh, you are holy, right? And holy means to be set apart. Uh, so in, in one sense, he's set them apart and he's selected them. He's chosen them to be his people out of all of the people on the face of the earth. Okay, so we've got an idea of what the word elect means, and now we can ask another question. Who? Who are the elected then? Who really is Paul referring to here? Um, Again, in short, the church. Uh, The church is who he's referring to. The elect here means church. In the New Testament, it can also mean Christ. Christ himself is the chosen one. He's, He's a part of the elect. He's what you might call the first of the elect. Uh, so uh, we, we have several examples actually from the book of First Peter. First Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. So Peter is writing his letter to the church, to the elect exiles that have dispersed out away from uh, Jerusalem and Judea. Chapter 2, verse 4, 1 Peter 2, 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. So here we're talking about Jesus, who's been chosen by God, although not by the people of Israel, but he was chosen by God. He's chosen and precious. Later in that chapter, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here, 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter is, actually has in mind that Deuteronomy 7 passage, right? In Deuteronomy 7, God said essentially the same thing of the Israelites. And Peter is making mention that now that chosen people of God is the church. That chosen people of God are those who trust in God's chosen one, Jesus Christ. 
Romans 8.33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? The context there makes it clear that this is the church that Paul is talking about. The elect means church. So when Paul says, for the sake of the elect, he means for the benefit of the church. Now, lest we misunderstand and think that <clears throat> he would go out and buy us a car, right, if that's what we wanted, uh, he has a very specific benefit in mind, right? He says, for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. That they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. So first, Paul specifies that he's not just talking about anyone's salvation. He's not, he's not talking about salvation or being saved from something as a general concept. He's talking about the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Now, of course, he's talking to Timothy. Timothy probably would have understood the shorthand salvation, but Paul's making a point <clears throat> that our salvation rests in Christ Jesus. Our salvation only makes any sense in Christ Jesus. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me or except through me. And what does Acts 4.12 say? Peter's talking in Acts 4.12 and he says, and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There are, of course, lots of other people offering salvation. There are, of course, lots of other people trying to earn salvation in one way or another. There's lots of religions that claim to provide salvation in one way or another. Paul's not talking about any of that because at the end of the day, all of that will vanish and will be useless and will not hold up. What he's talking about is the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, the only way to have peace with God. Paul is talking about the only way for you and I to get what we desperately need and what we really want, if we're honest, peace with God, peace with God, reconciliation with God. Friends, this is offered to any and to all of us, but only in the name of Christ Jesus only by what Christ Jesus has done, not by what we've done, not by what we think we can attain on our own, but only through Christ Jesus. Secondly here, what does it mean that they also may obtain the salvation? So we know exactly what the salvation is that he's talking about, but if the elect means the church, wouldn't this also indicate that they have already obtained salvation, right? It, it almost seems like uh, Paul lost track of what he was saying here. Uh, if the elect means the church, wouldn't they already have obtained salvation? Yes and no. <laughs> it depends on how you want to look at it. Um, I think there's two aspects to this. On the one hand, uh, he means this for the church, for the current church that he's talking about, the church universal, those who have already accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would persevere, that they would endure. The second aspect is for those that are a part of the church, but not yet. You see, remember this word elect is chosen, right? And we know again from Romans that God, or Ephesians even, that God has chosen before the foundations of the earth those who are his. That means that today, this very moment, there are people walking on this earth that are chosen, but they've not yet believed. They're chosen, but they've not yet believed. And so Paul has these two aspects in mind. The first aspect, for those that have already believed, that they persevere. Believe it or not, this is a major theme of the New Testament. It's a major theme of Revelation. It's a major theme of the book of Hebrews. In our book, 2 Timothy 11 through 13, he mentions this, verse 12. If we endure, that's a conditional clause. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Just briefly, verses 12 and 13, think of verse 12 as Judas, 
right? He denied Christ finally with no repentance, demonstrating that he was not a part of the elect, that he was not a part of the church. Peter, on the other hand, is more like verse 13. He also denied Christ in what you might think of, or I think what Paul is using in a faithless way. He did repent. He did turn away from his sin. He did turn back to Christ and ultimately demonstrated that he is a part of the elect, that he was a part of the church. Revelation 1.7, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This little phrase, to the one who conquers, shows up to all seven of the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. If you're in Sunday school, we've been spending a lot of time there. The idea is that it's not just a matter of coasting. It's not just a word that we say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and then it's over. It's, it requires perseverance. It requires endurance to make it to the end. Hebrews is perhaps the most well-known. I'll just read one verse from Hebrews. Chapter 3, verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. You could look at it this way. As long as you're living, there remains an opportunity for you to demonstrate that you're not a part of the church. As long as you're living, there remains an opportunity for you to demonstrate that. Now, that might be the negative way of looking at it. The positive way is as long as you're living, there's plenty of opportunities for you to demonstrate that you are a true follower of Christ, that you are indeed saved, that you are indeed a part of the church. Okay, so the first aspect is Paul will endure everything for the sake of these that have already obtained salvation that, or that have already come into the church, and their need is to persevere. The second aspect is those who have not heard yet, those who have not heard yet. In Romans, Paul spends uh, two or three chapters talking about the place of Israel in the new covenant. He begins that section by saying this, chapter 9, verse 3, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. If you catch what Paul is saying here, he's saying that he would trade in his salvation for his brothers and sisters, for the Jewish people. When Paul says, I endure everything, it's not an idle word. He means it. He would do anything that those who are chosen already would come to know Christ, that they would have a chance to hear the gospel and that they would respond and turn to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is arguing that those who have sown spiritual things, those who teach, those who preach, those who disciple, those who uh, uh, lead others in spiritual matters, they have a right to receive financial remuneration. Of course, that's not the topic of this sermon this morning. But his point is that he actually didn't make use of that. He did not make use of that with the Corinthians. With the Corinthian people, he did not take anything from them. From them. He says, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 12, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. So again, he uses a very similar phrase, right? We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of Jesus Christ. Paul is adamant that his life not be an obstacle to anyone coming to know Christ. He's adamant that his life not be a, a stumbling block for any of his brothers and sisters that might turn away from Christ because of the way that he is living. He's not asking the question, what will make me happy? He's asking the question, what will bring others to know Christ? So we read verse 10, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We still have this last little phrase, with eternal glory. Did you know that your salvation comes with eternal glory? 
Did you know that? Your salvation comes with eternal glory. Forgive me, but I can't help but think of uh, an infomercial incessantly reminding you that if you call now, you can get two for the price of one. (laughs) Obviously, that's not quite what's going on here, but uh, it's far greater. It's far better. He mentions the salvation that is in Christ, Christ Jesus, and then he says, with eternal glory. Lest we forget, our salvation comes with eternal glory. This is absolutely amazing. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Romans 8, 16 through 18. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So again, there's that conditional clause, but there's also the glory. If we suffer with Christ, we likewise will be glorified with him with Christ. Continuing in Romans 8, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this is Paul talking, remember the guy who was beat and stoned and left for dead, uh, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There's at least There's at least two different aspects of this. The one is the glory of Christ Jesus, which he has now that will be presented to us, that we get to enjoy. But the second is that we are his brothers and sisters. We are Christ's brothers and sisters. And Hebrews makes the point that though he's the one that has earned that glory, he is the one that has earned all of it, he shares it with you and me. So we not only enjoy his glory, but we participate in his glory with eternal glory, has at least those two aspects in mind. Okay, so time for a brief application, if you'll permit me. I think at the moment we have a pretty good idea of what the message is of 2 Timothy 2.10, right? Paul has endured everything that the chosen people of God will indeed persevere until the end, and that any that don't know Christ yet would have that chance and would turn from their sin to trust in Christ and hence then be resurrected with him in in eternal glory. What does this mean for you and me? Is Paul simply um, recounting this to uh, regale us with his stories? Is Paul simply trying to underscore to Timothy, you know what, I'm a pretty good guy, right? I'm, I'm going to endure everything. Obviously not, right? Uh, Paul is mentioning this because, as he says in 1 Corinthians, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. His point is to provide an example. And hence, the question should not be lost on us. What are we willing to endure? What are we willing to commit to endure right now for the sake of Christ? Can we actually say with Paul, I will endure everything for the sake of the elect, that some might come to know Christ? Are we willing to endure insults or mockery? How about offense or betrayal? How about being thought little of or worse, being thought much of in some cases? How about daily discipline in godliness? Are we willing to endure daily discipline? How about misfortune, loss of wealth, being taken advantage of? Prison, beatings, what Paul mentions explicitly. Are we willing to endure those things that others might know Christ? How about forfeiture of goods or possessions when the time comes? This is not from left field, but how about eating vegan or abstaining from alcohol? If you knew for a fact that if you didn't eat meat for the rest of your life, five people would come to know Christ, would you do it? 
If you knew that your drinking is actually causing someone else to question their faith, would you stop? I refer you to 1 Corinthians 10 for a further discussion. How about dressing modestly? I mean that in at least both ways, not extravagantly and not sensually. Are we willing to endure that, that others might come to know Christ? How about church discipline? Again, a double entendre. Are we willing to endure meeting it out, which is by no means an easy process? And if you're on the receiving end of church discipline, are you willing to accept it? Or will you, by your denial of it, indicate that you are not a believer? How about monogamy or celibacy? The list goes on. How about giving unto poverty? Paul says the Macedonians did this. They gave until they themselves were impoverished. Are we willing to do that? Or is that just an unwise idea? What are we willing to do that others might come to know Christ? We can switch it around a little bit and say, what are we willing to give up? Or what are we willing to add on in order that others might come to know Christ? Now, of course, you can't just pick something and say, okay, I'm going to do without this, and then magically someone will come to know Christ. Uh, Part of the trick is identifying what, right? What is causing someone else to stumble? Or what is is maybe my coworker or my neighbor um, just ignoring my witness because there's nothing different about me? Why should he add Christ on to everything else, which looks like just what we're doing? instead of perhaps the massive swap, the massive uh, switch that we see Paul doing, where now everything in his life is organized around that principle of Christ, that Christ may be glorified, that others might come to know Christ. We've seen here this morning uh, a method and a message. The method, as I mentioned, is is not super special. Uh, I'm simply trying to underscore an an easy way, actually, that you can learn from the text. You can ask who, what, when, where, why, how, and you can learn by reading and observing the text. As we applied the method, we learned a little bit about the context of 2 Timothy. We learned about the context of 2 Timothy 2.10, what surrounds it, what's going on, and hopefully that's enough for you to criticize this message and to say, did he get it right? Is that actually what the context is talking about? Or, you know, maybe I'm off base, which could always be the case. In conclusion, I I want us to walk away with that question. Not, Not what can we do for Christ, that's the wrong question. Christ has done everything for us. But can we say with Paul, I will endure everything for the sake of the elect, that my life is is not a stumbling block to anyone, and that my life is leading others to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask that this would be the cry of our heart this morning, that we would, like Paul, Commit to this. Commit to this beforehand, before the trials come, that we will say, you know what? I will endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Father, may that be the organizing principle of our lives. May it not be pleasure May it not be comfort. May it not be ease. May it not be fun. May it not be money or things. The list goes on. The various ways that we turn elsewhere. Lord, may it not be any of those things, but may it be you. 
May the organizing principle of our lives be that we bring glory to you and that we cause others also to look to you and to glorify you. We thank you so very much for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Our salvation is completely dependent on him. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen.